My name is Takeshi Hamamuram, and I'm going to be talking about a cultural psychological analysis of cultural change. So uh, cultural dynamics is my area of research, which refers to the formation, maintenance, and transformation of uh, culture over time. Uh, I want to start uh, talking a, li a little bit about why it's important to study cultural dynamics. Uh, and I want to do this with an example, uh, which is a cultural distance map created by Ms. Krishna and colleagues, uh, a very recent paper, which is based on the data drawn from the World Values Survey. So the data collection took place between 2005 and 2014. X-axis on the map is a cultural distance from, from America, from the United States. Y-axis is a distance from China. Uh, such a fascinating work, uh, and I think this is a kind, kind of thing that inspires many interesting research questions. One question in my mind, coming from cultural dynamics perspective, is change over time. So if we, if we can make the same kind of map using data from 1970s or 1980s, how is that map going to look like? What will be the similarities and differences? What if we can make the same kind of map 20 years from now or 50 years from now in 2072? What is that map going to look like? Is it going to be the same as the one on the slide or is it going to be different? Is there any way of making a prediction of how that map is going to look like? These are the kind of questions that I'm interested in with cultural dynamics. And uh, so why is it important to study cultural dynamics? For one thing, culture is not static. Um, so there may be some things that are more stable, more uh, likely to continue over time, but many things seem to change over time. So if that's the case, if culture is actually not static, we should examine and re-examine snapshot views of culture over time. I elaborate what I mean with example. So in 1991, Marcus and Kiyama proposed cultural difference in the self-concept. According to this model, interdependent view of the self is a widespread way of understanding the self in East Asian societies like China, Japan, and Korea. This model has been an important, uh, essential aspect of cultural research in psychology. But it's been 30 years since Marcus and Kiyama proposed this model. Um, is this model still applicable and vibrant, you know, vibrant and relevant today? Is the interdependent view of the self still uh, uh, prevalent uh, among East Asians? If things are changing, it's important that we should update things. If things are not changing, that's interesting uh, uh, on its own, but we can, uh, and we can keep using uh, snapshot views uh, uh, that were proposed some time ago. This is one reason why it's important to study cultural dynamics to differentiate these kind of questions. And then another reason for studying cultural dynamics may be to recognize influence that Western cultures have had around the world. What I mean by this is a historical sort of imbalance of power between Western cultures and non-Western cultures, or between global North and global South. So for this reason, it's been often the case that ideas and, and practices originating from Western cultures are exported uh, to non-Western cultures, exported, adopted, and transplanted from Western to non-Western cultures. Consequences of these kind of cultural influence and exchange is something we should pay attention to. And of course, we do that all the time in cross-cultural psychology. Uh, especially when this kind of uh, influence, cultural influence, cultural exchange is having a harmful effect. One example of this may be Western trained psychologists prescribing practices and therapies of mental health uh, that are actually harmful uh, to local community. This is reported uh, you know, repeatedly in the literature, but one example may be uh, Sri Lanka. Um, you know, harmful effect reported uh, uh, in the aftermath of the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. Understanding cultural dynamics in relation to these kind of issues is important to to, uh, to recognize for recognizing dominant influence of Western culture and to think uh, possible ways of counteracting. <clears throat> So these are the reasons why it's important to study cultural dynamics. 
my own research has been focusing on cultural dynamics in East Asia. Uh, I'm very much interested in the formation, maintenance, and transformation of cultures in East Asia. Some transformative changes are taking place in uh, East Asia. So what it's like to live in Japan or China today is a very different experience compared to our parents' generations or grandparents' generations. This is one example uh, that I like um, uh, talking about. Uh, arranged marriage. So you get, you know, you marry somebody uh, who is introduced to you by your friends, by your family members, or by your colleagues. Arranged marriage still happens in Japan today, but much, uh, uh, it's not, a, uh, it's only about 5% of our marriage today. A uh, vast majority of marriage today in Japan is a marriage by love. So you meet somebody, you fall in love, and you marry this person. So that's a societal norm today. A societal norm of marriage today, Japan in Japan today, is love-based marriage. And things are very different in 1940s. So if anything, societal norm was arranged marriage. And, and uh, marriage by love, it happened, but it was much less frequent and accounted for only about one-fifth of our marriages in 1940s. So this is one interesting example of Japanese people's experience in life changing over time. So I'm interested in the question of how cultures in East Asia are maintaining and transforming. More specifically, I'm interested in questions like how is modernization and globalization transforming cultures in the region? And what are, if anything, cultural uh, characteristics, cultural traits and attributes that have not changed over time, that are, are, are more, more or less stable over time. In thinking about these questions, some years ago, I decided to focus on individualism collectivism. One of the reasons was because individualism is such a big part of cross-cultural research. So essentially, my question was whether or not cultures in East Asia are still collectivistic and, and interdependent. Um, I wanted to do a brief review of the literature before going into the specific of my projects. So first of all, there's a strong evidence of positive correlation between individualism and indices of affluence. So I'm talking about cross-sectional correlation. So more affluent, more developed, more uh, rich uh, societies, countries tended to be more individualistic compared to less developed, less affluent, uh, less wealthy countries and societies. Even within the countries, there's a plenty of evidence indicating that regions that are affluent and uh, are more developed tended to be more individualistic compared to less uh, developed uh, prefectures and states and provinces within the same country. So robust cross-sectional evidence linking individualism and uh, um, uh, economic growth or the affluence. Projecting this correlation into the time dimension, it has been hypothesized that cultures around the world, especially in those parts where economy is growing, may be shifting away from collectivism toward individualism. However, this idea of global rise of individual individualism has been actually controversial, uh, especially when applied to East Asian context. For uh, one thing, generations of Asia-based psychologists have argued that modernization in this region, in Asia, occurs without causing individualism. Cultural psychology research uh, continues to find social interdependence and holistic cognition in contemporary East Asia. Um, so I think it's fair to say that Marcus and Kitayama's model of independence interdependence is still seen as a very much applicable and relevant in comparing contemporary East Asians with contemporary Westerners. If East Asia has become more individualistic as a result of economic development and affluence, how is it that we seem to keep finding stronger interdependence and holistic cognition in Asia? Interestingly, in a worldwide analysis, increase in individualism was evident in most countries, but not in China. So it turned out that the global increase in individualism that uh, Santos and colleagues 
uh, Santos and colleagues demonstrated this global pattern of rising in individualism was actually not evident in China. So that's uh, sort of the background for my uh, project. So in 2012, I uh, uh, did uh, publish this paper that compared individualism, collectivism, cultural change between the US and China. For this paper, I examined a number of demographic and uh, survey indices to make inferences about cross-temporal uh, cross changes. Um, the figure, the graph here, is plotting in inflation and the adjusted per capita GDP for US and Japan between the period of 1950s to 2008, just to um, demonstrate that there has been this long-term gradual increase in per capita GDP in both countries, uh, to the extent that individualism increases with rising, you know, uh, with economic growth, individualism should be increasing in both countries. So that was some um, uh, idea going into the into uh, this investigation. These are the indices that I examined uh, in this project. So some of the indices uh, were obtained from demographics. Uh, so household size, divorce, and urbanization. And items four to nine came from world values survey, so self-report responses. All of these indices were uh, conceptually related to individualism. And I also conducted some empirical tests, so sort of um, validating that each of these indices actually capture uh, uh, variance in individualism. So that's some, that's uh, the conceptual and empirical relationship I established prior to the analysis. Some of the indices were available uh, uh, just in Japan and just in America. And these are the self-report items available only in Japan. Uh, these items were from National Characteristic Study in Japan. So long ongoing uh, uh, survey that asks uh, same set of questions about attitude and beliefs and values uh, uh, every five years or every 10 years to a nationally representative sample. Again, all of these items were screened for their conceptual and empirical relationship with individualism. These are some of the findings from that project. Uh, this particular graph is showing changes in demographic over time. Household size uh, uh, has declined in both countries. So, for example, in Japan, uh, so that's this, uh, this one, this, this, um, this uh, data. Household size, on average, uh, average uh, Japanese household had about five people in 1950, but in 2008, it was about 2.8. A uh, similar kind of trend is evident in both countries, so the trend is, I guess, more dramatic in Japan. Divorce has increased uh, over time in both countries. Uh, there are ups and downs. So, for example, in, in U.S., there is this spike of divorce rate around 1980s. Uh, but if you take this long-term 50 years uh, time span, you see an uh, increase of divorce rate uh, over time. A similar story with urbanization, so it has gone up in both countries. These are some of the indices, some of the findings from Japanese national surveys, so self-report uh, items uh, related to individualism collectivism. It's a little bit harder to see what's going on with this graph, so I have another graph for you. Um, some graphs I made with Excel. <laughs> Uh, my data analytic technique uh, doesn't rely on Excel anymore. I use, I'm a little bit more sophisticated these days, uh, but you know, uh, 2012, this was the best I could do. Um, I highlight, highlighted some of the key findings from the Japanese data. Uh, blue is a data about respect individual. So what this was is that so this is a self-report question. Uh, survey respondents asked about what are the important principles in your life, you know, so asking about their values in their day-to-day -day living. Uh, living. Uh, how important, so this is indicating percentage of respondents who said respecting individual is important principle in my life. 
to, if you know, individualism has gone up in Japan, you would expect a um, percentage of Japanese saying respecting individual to have also gone up as well. But this is not something we saw. So as you can see, the blue line is going down over time. Similar kind of trend uh, with the orange line. So orange line is about honoring obligations. Uh, is honoring obligation an important part of um, in your life? Again, if, if we are to hypothesize that individualism has gone up in Japan, you would expect obligation to have become maybe less important of a value over time, but this is not the case. So if anything, uh, the honoring obligation seems to have gone up slightly as indicated by this you know, going up trend of the orange one. So to summarize our findings from this project, so uh, some indices suggested rising individualism. So I mentioned urbanization, household size, and divorce. Uh, in addition, there was an uh, indication that uh, tradition following has become less important among Japanese survey respondents. And there's also an uh, indication that when it comes to child socialization, independence is seen as a more important goal of socialization among a recent uh, cohort of Japanese respondents compared to um, in older uh, cohorts of Japanese respondents. Other indices, however, suggested maintaining collectivism uh, in Japan. So um, in increased importance of so social obligations and respect for individual rights has actually become less important. In addition to these findings, there was also an indication of continuing importance of unconditional love toward parents, friendship, and social harmony. Uh, and uh, a greater importance placed on effort for success and social contribution is seen as essential for fulfilling life. Uh, you know, so this was actually unchanging over time. So uh, very much uh, findings of mixed patterns, some indices showing rising individuals in rising individualism, but other indices not showing the same pattern, suggesting maintaining cultural collectivism. So um, this project was very much a case of mixed finding, which is fine, um, you know, which gave me some uh, uh, new questions. Uh, next questions. One question was, uh, you know, how do I make sense of this uh, mixed finding? Uh, so what aspect of individualism actually change and what aspects of collectivism actually maintain? So this is a question that I couldn't really uh, uh, explain systematically in my uh, uh, in the 2012 paper. Uh, so this was uh, my uh, next question. Um, but it was clear to me that to be able to answer this question uh, well, we need data that permits more detailed, more in-depth, and more nuanced analysis. Uh, and how do we get such data was one big question that I had to uh, struggle for a while. Another question was that, um, uh, is this finding uh, specific to Japan or is this something more broadly evident in East Asia? So do we also see this mixed back finding of some aspect of culture you know, rising individualism, but some aspects maintaining collectivism? Do we get the same kind of pictures when you look at China, uh, when you look at Korea or Taiwan, uh, et cetera, et cetera? So that was another question of mine. So I did conduct follow-up study looking into China, but before that, I just wanna talk a little bit about the methodology of studying cultural dynamics. Uh, so the project is a 2012 paper I used demographics and surveys, as I, as I mentioned. This is one method uh, that's available to us in uh, um, you know, study, conducting studies on cultural dynamics, but this is not the only way and actually in recent years, more and more methods have been introduced. And some of these methods are not very familiar to psychologists. And this is a very interesting development in my opinion. Uh, to uh, give you a taste of you know, type of uh, um, methodologies being used in this field, I just wanted to talk about this special issue on cultural change 
that was put together by Igor Grossman and Michael Burnham last year uh, had uh, 16 articles examining different aspects of cultural dynamics. It's a fascinating collection of articles, uh, of course, for you know, the questions and topics that they look at, but it's also a fascinating collection in terms of the diverse set of methodologies that these 16 papers used. Uh, I just wanted to call your attention to methodology used by multiple papers in this uh, special issue. So a few papers, three papers that used agent-based model. There are also several papers that used survey data. Uh, in I think in, yeah, in most cases, the data covers multiple decades and multiple countries. Uh, so these two studies uh, that used world values survey, I believe they used data from uh, most, if not all countries across uh, all waves of um, uh, their collections. So you know, this is a very much a case of a massive uh, big data uh, kind of approach in understanding cultural dynamics. <laughs> Uh, and then um, there were two studies that used analysis of language for the text. This includes our paper that used uh, 50 years of printed text in uh, looking at individuals and collectivism change in China. So this is a uh, methodology that I wanna introduce next. So uh, my next project focused on analysis of language. Um, so this is not a, uh, this is a one methodology that's being uh, used um, uh, from time to time in uh, different field of psychology, especially in cultural and cross-cultural psychology. So things like book and song lyrics and news article is often uh, used to understand you know, cross-cultural differences uh, changes over time, et cetera, et cetera, in studying cultural dynamics. One way to uh, study cultural, sorry, one way to study language use uh, is to uh, focus on the changes, uh, historical changes in word meaning. So this is approach that we took in, uh, in the next project. So this is something I wanna introduce a little bit. Um, so historical shift in word meaning, one way to get into this kind, one way to uh, answer this kind of question is to uh, look at how a specific word is defined in dictionary, uh, just like, just as uh, Shige Oishi did uh, in this uh, paper, looking at the dictionary definition of happiness in English language for the past 200 years. So what they did uh, in this project was to send many research assistants to university libraries and to find different historical editions of uh, English dictionaries and then code how the word happiness is defined in you know, all these diff dictionaries of, from all these years. So very interesting and very interesting data, um, but it's also very time and labor intensive work. So even though uh, these analyses can provide very insightful uh, uh, finding, this is not something you can easily scale. Uh, so it's one thing to focus on one word, you know, the happiness, but what if you are interested in, you know, like a bunch of concepts, a bunch of words, uh, it's not very easy to implement because of the time and uh, resource uh, requirement for this, uh, for this kind of uh, methodology. So this is where uh, application of uh, natural language processing uh, can actually make sense. So basic idea is the same. So the basic idea is that we want to understand how meaning of specific words have changed over time. But uh, I mean, rather than sending research assistant into the library, why, why don't we use computers to model word meaning in uh, using some techniques that have been developed in data science and uh, computer science? So that's sort of the basic idea. There are many different approaches in uh, natural language processing, and I'm not an expert, so I can only give you some entry level information uh, in this part of the uh, presentation, uh, uh, the references. 
that I have on the on this slide is an excellent source if you want to get in uh, get more sort of in depth information about uh, these techniques. So there are many different approaches in NLP. Particular approach we used is designed to numerically represent word meaning. So the idea is to represent a word, specific word, as a point uh, in some multi-dimensional semantic space. Uh, I give you some examples uh, uh, what I mean by this. Uh, but before that, uh, let me just explain some insights, some ideas behind this algorithm. So two key ideas behind this algorithm. One is that word, uh, words that occur in similar context tended to have similar meaning. The other one is that the meaning of a word can be expressed as a vector, a bunch of numbers that involve some ways of counting neighboring words. To illustrate what I mean, I have this table on the slide. Uh, so this example is focusing on four words, cherry, uh, strawberry, digital, and information. And this is an uh, imaginary example. Uh, so imagine that you have uh, all the Wikipedia pages in English language. I don't know how many pages there are, but we have all the pages. And for each page, we count, um, how, um, we uh, 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 sort of tab tabulate, we count how many word and how many of different kind of word are appearing in that page. Uh, so we are just focusing on four of those words, cherry, strawberry, digital, and information. So that's one information. You know, uh, what kind of word are mentioned in Wikipedia uh, pages? And then for each word, we also uh, examine their context word. So, so for example, every time the word cherry is mentioned, what word uh, is mentioned right before and right after the word cherry? So that's uh, uh, another information that we are going to capture in this uh, data collection. So uh, with that, we can see that the word digital, for example, uh, is mentioned more often with things like computer and data as opposed to pie and sugar. So uh, it's a very simple idea, I think, very intuitive ideas. Uh, of course, it, we are talking about massive, you know, large amount of data. We are just focusing on very small example. But the idea is that once you develop this kind of table, this kind of matrix of word count, then that information, that data, actually contains valuable information about the meaning of all these words. And that word meaning can be actually estimated and modeled by some procedures in data science, like machine learning techniques. So that's um, sort of the big picture idea behind this approach. And this is a kind of thing that you get from this kind of uh, approach. So we are uh, representing word meaning as a bunch of numbers and as a location uh, on a multidimensional space. Uh, so this is one example of what it means to numerically represent what meaning, um, and then how this kind of data can be actually used to study cultural change. This particular picture figure is from Hist World Project. The figure is visualizing historical shift uh, in meaning of three words, gay, broadcast, and awful. Um, very I think it's very intuitive, uh, you know, very interesting visualization of the data. Uh, and so my idea was, you know, it would be great to use this exact technique to make inferences about how things are changing uh, in terms of the cultures in um, East Asia. So that's the idea. Um, and in the literature, uh, there are now several examples of this method being used to uh, illustrate to demonstrate some very interesting cultural changes. So I want to uh, introduce a few of those. First example is uh, example uh, is, a, is a work by Haslam, Nick Haslam. Uh, propose, so Haslam and his group propose that there has been a gradual semantic expansion of harm-related concepts. This is known as the theory of con uh, concept creep. One of the findings from Haslam's group is this picture on the slide, on this uh, data on the, on the slide. So uh, they looked at the meaning of the word addiction using the same NLP approach I just described. 
Uh, with this data, we can tell that in the 1980s, the word addiction had the highest similarity to words related to substance like drug, alcohol, and heroin. However, in recent decades, the word addiction has become more similar to behavioral terms like internet, gaming, and sexual. So one way to understand this pattern is that in 1980s, addiction was mentioned almost always with uh, in words indicating substance, so addiction to substance. However, in more recent decade, um, in addition to you know, this kind of addiction to substance, addiction is also used in relation to behavioral stuff. And this pattern is actually consistent with the idea that there has been a semantic expansion not harm related concept. The word addiction is used in a wider range of concept than before. Word similarity data has been actually quite useful in uncovering uh, stereotypes and prejudice. Stereotypes and prejudice, these are, you, know, you can argue these are cultural uh, products, um, how ideas are associated and, and connected at the level of culture. And it turned out that word similarity data is actually quite useful in uh, looking at these kind of things. So Kaliskan and colleagues argued that the language, our, our way of using language contains the same kind of bias that, that psychologists may capture in studying stereotype and prejudice. Uh, so the figure here is showing gender bias that was captured in an analysis of natural language. Um, so, you know, a nurse as opposed to engineer, um, nurse, the word, uh, related to nursing occupation is more similar to female uh, word that indicate female genders as opposed to a word that indicate engineering occupation. Those words tend to be more similar to a uh, word that indicate male gender. Uh, so one indication of gender bias in um, uh, language use. This kind of approach has been used in cross temporal sense um, so this paper by Gerg and colleagues is looking at historical changes in gender bias. So these examples demonstrate how uh, word similarity data can be actually used to study historical changes in cultural um, associations like stereotype or concept creep. So uh, using this methodology, uh, uh, I, uh, with a team of, uh, well, with, with my team, conducted a project to uh, study individualism, collectivism, cultural change in China. And we examined these three questions on the slide. Uh, the first question is Chinese culture more possibly disposed to individualism over time? So the idea is that if individualism is actually rising in China as a result of uh, economic growth, maybe uh, individualism has become more acceptable, has become more positive over time. So that was the idea. Okay? If individualism has actually become more acceptable and positive, then it may be the case that there's a stronger association, stronger similarities between individualism and positive. Word that indicate individualism and word indicate positivity may be more strongly uh, more, more similar over time. To examine this research question, we looked at similarity between words that indicate positive valence, negative valence, individualism word, and collectivism word. And we asked the question, is there a stronger similarity between individualism word with positive word over time? We used uh, some word from Chinese version of the dictionaries. Uh, we, uh, so this was a case for positive and negative word. We newly developed uh, new dictionaries uh, for individualism and collectivism. This is uh, just a brief intro, uh, explanation, brief description of our method. So we used word similarity data uh, available in the HIST word project. Uh, our data is based on the Google, corp, uh, Google corpus, Google book corpus. Uh, and for some technical reasons that I'm not going to go into detail, uh, 
this data goes only up to 1999. So our analysis was just looking at basically the second half of the 20th century going from 1950s to 1990s. So the last 20 years uh, of, you know, like anything after 2000 is, is was missing from this project. So that's one limitation. Uh, the graph here is an illustrative example of how this data works. So for this graph, we looked at three word pairs and plotted each word's uh, similarity. Blue line is indicating a stronger similarity between the word market and economy. So blue line is going up. This is consistent with sort of the common sense understanding of, of a greater market orientation of the Chinese economy during this period. So it's just an illustrative example to give you a taste of how this data works. Okay, so to examine the first research question, we had over 3,500 uh, word pairs with decade by decade similarity score available for each word pair. Uh, so what we, what we had was very large uh, longitudinal uh, data set. The graph is showing uh, a, a similarity. So the word similarity it indicates whether a specific target word, so in this case, either positive word or a negative word. So whether a positive word were more similar with individualism or collectivism. Positive values on this graph indicates stronger similarity with individualism. Negative value, so going down on the, on the graph, indicates stronger uh, similarity with collectivism. For positive word, if um, individualism is seen as more positive over time, you would expect this red line to be in the positive direction. Maybe it should be going up. That's uh, what you would expect based on this idea of individualism becoming more widely accepted and becoming more positive thing over time. But this is not something we found. So there was no evidence of individual uh, individualism ward being more similar to positive ward over time. So the uh, red line was very close to zero. Also, there was no interaction uh, over time, no interaction between uh, individualism and uh, and uh, and the time uh, over time indicating no evidence, no of, uh, positivity individualism association strengthening over time. For the second question, we asked is achievement more closely associated with individualism over time? So the idea for this question comes from research on the socialization process in China that suggests a stronger emphasis over time on individual competitiveness and achievement in Chinese socialization. So we examined whether individualism was a, a, a more similar to achievement world and whether this pattern is changing over time. Uh, results for this analysis found no evidence no achievement uh, being more similar to individualism world. So um, the line was, uh, wasn't was in the positive direction. And if anything, it was actually going down, indicating stronger association, uh, stronger similarity uh, with collectivism over time. So there was an indication of achievement world becoming more similar over time with collectivism world. Next research question was, uh, is collectivism continuing, continuing in some life domains? Uh, ideas for this research question is based on the pluralistic ignorance model of collectivism. So it becomes sort of the hardcore uh, social psychology and cultural psychology. Uh, pluralistic ignorance model, um, very interesting idea, and it has been uh, used in relation to collectivism in Asia. So Toshio Yamagishi and colleagues uh, proposed, uh, uh, proposed this idea that people in contemporary uh, Asian societies may, believe, may be believing that their culture is collectivistic. And maybe it's you know, this belief that our society is collectivistic, that um, people are behaving in collectivistic fashion. This idea can actually explain uh, the prevalence of collectivistic behaviors in public. Interestingly, this model maintains that private beliefs and values 
may be actually divorced from people's public behaviors. So using this model, we examined two possibilities. One possibility is that collectivism may be continuing in China, especially in public life domains. So the idea is that people in contemporary Chinese society believe that their social environment uh, favors collectivism and behave accordingly. This pattern may be especially evident in public life domains like work with stronger incentives for conforming to and not deviating from perceived norms of collectivism. The uh, pattern may be different between public and private domains. So in private domains, people may experience a weaker incentive to conform to perceived norms of collectivism. So um, in private domains, private life domains, there may be evidence of collectivism actually decreasing and being replaced by individualism. So that's a kind of question we wanted to look at uh, in this part of the project. So for the uh, uh, research question three, we used uh, dictionaries for uh, life domains included in look, work, leisure, home, money, religion, and death. We operationalized work to be an example of public life domain, and leisure and home to be examples of private life domains. Um, this is not the most rigorous classification because our classification was based on what's available in Luke. So this is one limitation of, uh, for this analysis. But with this limitation in mind, we found that the words indicating work were actually more similar to collectivism word. So the red line, uh, this line here, was uh, consistently in the negative direction over time. We also found that one example of private life domain, so leisure, this yellow one, uh, was uh, becoming more similar to individualism over time. So you see this uh, sort of the rising trend or increasing trend over time, indicating increasing similarity. So in summary, these results seem to suggest that work is more closely associated with collectivism in the second half of the 20th century in China, and leisure uh, did become increasingly associated with individualism over time. We think these findings provide some evidence to, the, to this idea of uh, plural, pluralistic uh, ignorance of collectivism in contemporary China. Okay, so limitations and next questions. So one big limitation is that this project uh, only looked at the trend up to 1999. So we don't know if what I just described is evident for the last 20 years. And that's a big limitation because of the substantial economic growth of the Chinese economy. So, you know, the second findings from the 20th century may not really apply to the last 20 years. Uh, so this limitation uh, needs to be addressed, uh, and we are we are doing that right now uh, for the next project. So uh, uh, stay tuned, and hopefully we can report something uh, uh, shortly. Uh, I'd also like to examine things beyond individualism collectivism. So again, I'm very interested in cultural dynamics of East Asia, and there are many questions beyond individualism collectivism, of course, that are important to understand. One example is this project uh, that Kong Min Liu is conducting. So Kong is this year's winner of Triandis Award for a doctoral dissertation. Uh, so he's doing this keynote address uh, during the conference. Uh, in one of his presentation, uh, he is gonna be talking about cultural dynamics of gender attitude in Japan using tweet as, as data. So this is very, I think, a very good example of um, you know, uh, issues and questions in cultural dynamics beyond individualism that are important um, for, for um, East Asia. Okay, so just to conclude, in this conclusion, in this, uh, I provided some overview of the field of cultural dynamics research, what it means to study cultural dynamics, why it's important to conduct research on this topic. Uh, my research focused on cultural dynamics in Asia, East Asia, 
I presented data from China and Japan that suggests that rising individualism may not be the universal consequences of societal modernization. I should emphasize, I should emphasize that some indices uh, are clearly indicating rising individualism in Japan. And also there is some data coming from China that indicates rising individualism. So I'm not saying my claim is not individualism is not rising in China or Japan, but there seems to be some clear evidence of continuing collectivism in both of these countries. It's important to understand how and why collectivism seems to thrive in contemporary East Asia. And I mentioned how the pluralistic ignorance model of collectivism seems to provide some useful perspective on this topic. Rice theory of culture uh, is another model potentially useful in unpacking some of these complexities in cultural dynamics. These are the papers that I mentioned in today's presentation. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.